Thanks, Jim. Uh, you <laughs> no painted the big picture for us, <laughs> and it ties in perfectly with what I'm going to be talking about, the sovereignty of God. Um, raise your hand if you've heard that term. Probably everybody. When we talk about the sovereignty of God in the Christian world, uh, there's a lot of conjecture. It's a pretty big word. It's a little complicated. And if you ask anyone to define God's sovereignty, you'd probably get a lot of different answers. Most people relate it to power. But it's a term we use for earthly rulers too, especially kings. The Brits call Queen Elizabeth, um, her sovereign majesty, her highness. We use these term, the term sovereignty to communicate rule in a land here on earth. But how does an earthly ruler's sovereignty compare to the sovereignty of God? So here's what I'm going to do. I think it's very important that when we talk about these big concepts, something that is as, as important as the sovereignty of God that the Bible is full of, that we, we define this from the outset of the talk, lest we bring in a lot of our assumptions into this. So here, is, here would be my definition for God's sovereignty that I'll be working off today. It would be the freedom to use one's power and wisdom to accomplish their will. I notice these two terms. We're going to be talking about that. Um, so what we're going to do, the gist of my talk is going to be comparing and contrasting how all of this plays into God and what he tells us in his word versus how it all plays into the will, the power, the wisdom, and so forth of man. Is there a difference? If so, what is it? Does God possess complete sovereignty? Does man or do both? Is there a degree that maybe man has some and not God? Okay. If you ask any Christian if they believe that God is sovereign, you'd be hard-pressed to find one that says no, right? On the surface, everyone would say, well, of course I believe in the sovereignty of God. And they recognize his power. But they look at creation and they can see clearly God is miraculous. He's awesome. But if you dig beneath the surface and start to peel away the layers, each layer you peel with a probing question reveals more and more that they view God really as anything but sovereign. And the greatest assault by far in Christendom on the sovereignty of God is the false doctrine of the free will of man. Right. The reason is, if God is truly sovereign, if he has the freedom to use his power and infinite wisdom to accomplish his will, and man's will can somehow thwart that, then man is, at least in that area, and the biggest area of all, salvation, superior, more powerful, more free than God. It makes God out to be a liar. Right. It makes him infinitely powerful but powerless to accomplish what his will is. 1 Timothy 2.4. We all know what this says. We know what several of Paul's verses in regards to this say, and that Christ, or that God uh, is the Savior of all mankind, especially believers, that he wills, he desires that all will be saved. The question is, does God get his way? Yes. Is he truly sovereign? Yeah, amen. <laughs> he does. There are, theologians have created a theory to deal with the sovereignty of God and the will of God. And it's what I would call the two wills theory. They say that God has a sovereign will or an ultimate will and that he has a permissive will. And they explain this away in this sense. They say, well, it was God's will for Christ to die for mankind, but it wasn't his will that the Pharisees and the Romans, the people, sinned the way that they did against Christ. It's never God's will that sin take place. So we're going to say God has two wills. His sovereign will was that Christ die. That is going to be accomplished. This is hidden. That's going to happen no matter what. His permissive will is allowed to be broken by mankind. Okay? This is the theory. The problem with the theory is these two are always polar opposites. Right? 
God's sovereign will says he wants Christ to die. His permissive will says he doesn't want him to have to suffer at all. He doesn't want him to have to die. The truth is, God's will does not look like this. He does not have, um, he does not have a will that starts here and goes like this, as Christendom believes it does. Everything is in a straight line, and every good and bad thing that happens in everyone's life, in every animal's life, with every element of the weather, is perfectly plotted along this line. Right. Okay, and that's what we're going to be talking about. Before, we, before I move on, I want to, I want to just talk, touch a bit more on this free will of man topic. Because um, the idea is that man has the freedom to choose Christ and whether or not he's going to be saved. Let's see what the Bible says about this. Romans 3.10 Not one is just, not even one. None seek out God. And there's going to be a lot of scripture in my talk today, by the way, so I'm just going to keep going through it. You probably won't have a lot of time to look through. And you'll know a lot of these passages anyway. John 6.44 No one comes to Christ unless the Father who sent him draws them. Paul in Ephesians 2.8 Faith is a gift from God, not of ourselves, lest anyone should boast. Clearly, we are incapable of saving ourselves. Is our will free in any sense, though? You know, we all feel completely free, right? Every day, right now sitting here, you feel as though you have the freedom to get up out of your chair, to move around, to go to the bathroom, to get a cup of coffee. Do you really have free will to do even that? I remember growing up in church, a good friend of mine, his mother, and she was one of the elders' wives, she would always say, it's one of her most common catchphrases. God didn't create us to be robots. No. He didn't make us puppets. Here's the reality. God created us to be just that. But we don't feel as though we are. Right? We, don't, we don't feel that way. Um, let's see what God says in his word about who he is. If you have the Old Testament with you, and a lot of concordant folks don't, I know, but open up to Isaiah 46. We're going to be looking starting in verse 9. And I don't have my concordant Old Testament, by the way. I'm actually reading out of a different translation for the OT passages, but uh, in this case they're, they're very similar, and they tell us what we need to know. Now this is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah to the people of Israel after there's been issues with idol worship and these people not recognizing really who he is. And God says basically, so I'm going to tell you through Isaiah who I am. He says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. So the issue here is the uniqueness of God. God's saying, I am set apart. And by the way, when we call God holy, the term means separate, set apart. He's saying, I'm one of a kind. I'm in a class of my own. And you're acting, Israelites, like you don't get who I am. You don't understand what makes me God and different from every man. Okay, then he goes on. There is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done. Now, at this point, you might look at me and say, oh, Steve, you're talking about the sovereignty of God, right? But so far, all you've really told us about is the fact that God has foreknowledge. We, we hear that a lot. Well, God, God just knows what's coming in the future. He has a will. He has a plan. But he hasn't really planned out every little tiny detail in his creation. He just knows what's going to come about. And that's what makes him unique and what makes him God. Now, let's listen to what he says next. Okay, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, listen to this, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. In other words, God is saying, this is how I know the future, because I planned it. Right. I remember recently I was visiting with the Pilkingtons and Clyde used this wonderful analogy. He said, you know, God is like the great novelist. And we look at these other novelists and they're, we admire these people. You know, they, they conjure up these stories, they give all these little details that interweave. And God has done this for every single human being and animal and plant, everything in his creation. Billions and billions of lives and inanimate objects 
from the beginning of time, even time was an invention by Almighty God. It's awesome. It is awesome. So this is what God is saying. He's saying, here's what makes me God. That not only do I know the future, I have planned it, and everything will come about. Now the next question would be, if that's true, um, how far really does that extend? Does, does God have complete control over the tiniest, most insignificant little details in creation? Does he really need to? Does he need to control every flake of snow and every piece of gravel and blade of grass? You know, or is that really completely unnecessary? Consider this. Try and follow this logic here. If God says all my purpose will stand and any tiniest detail is left unfulfilled, <coughs> then we would look at God and we would say, this is what you said would happen, right? God would, God would say, yeah, that was my plan. That was my purpose. But, but this happened. Right? And God would have to say, yeah. To which we would say, well, not completely <coughs> sovereign. Almost there. Now, <laughs> let's consider this. These insignificant little details. And I met with a good friend of mine recently. Um, I knew him from a previous job when I lived in Ohio, and he's actually on the board for Ashland Seminary in Ohio. And we met for lunch, and we were talking about the sovereignty of God, and um, he, he was amazed that I had this crazy belief, you know, that God controls even the smallest, minor details. And he said, well, you know, Steve, I, I think that God controls the big things. He, he, like, like, for example, I think that he controlled us coming to meet each other and working for the same company. But I don't think he cared to deal with us, you know. He didn't orchestrate us meeting for lunch today. That's so insignificant. Why would it matter? Consider this. On our way over here this morning in the car, we got behind, uh, Nathan and I, and the kids were riding, and got behind a salt truck. And I thought, you know, what if, with the roads bad, what if a rock flung up on my windshield, cracked it, it startled me, and I fly off the side of the road, next thing I know I'm in the hospital, and maybe I'm in crucial condition, or maybe I'm okay, and I have the opportunity to witness to somebody. We would look at the end result of that, and we would definitely attribute it to God, right? That's a big thing. Mm -hmm. But it was the tiny, insignificant piece of gravel flung up on my windshield that set the chain reaction in motion right. that led to that final big event. In order for God to accomplish his purpose, he has to control the most minute, seemingly insignificant details. And we're going to look at that from two perspectives now. From his control over nature and his control over human affairs, over life. Um, and I'm just going to read through these. Don't, it's probably going to take a while to turn to them. But Psalm 147, 8 through 9. He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. Verses 15 through 18. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters heart frosts like ashes. He hurls down his crystals of ice like crumbs. He sends out his word and melts them. He makes his wind blow and the waters flow. Every aspect of creation, of the weather, is controlled by God. Isaiah 40, 26. Lift up your eyes high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. passage that um, I have a hard time getting through every time I read it. And we're going to turn there now. It's, uh, let's see. It's in Luke, and it's 19, verses 37 through 40. And I'll read it here in the concordant. Uh, 
Now at his already drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the entire multitude of the disciples begins rejoicing, praising God with a loud voice concerning all the powerful deeds which they perceived, saying, Blessed be the King coming in the name of the Lord, in heaven peace and glory among the highest. And some of the Pharisees from the throng say to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. In answering, Jesus said to them, I am saying to you that if ever these will be silent, the stones will be crying. Imagine yourself as a Pharisee confronting Jesus. He's being praised, and uh, you think it's inappropriate. And Jesus looks you in the eye and says, Truly I tell you, if these disciples, if these followers weren't praising me, the stones would be crying out. Inanimate objects. God has that kind of control. In Jonah chapter 4, we see God controlling a plant, a worm, and a wind. <laughs> a worm. Jonah is refusing to go to Nineveh. He's upset on the brink of you know wanting to commit suicide. He's asking God, please kill me. I don't want to go talk to these people. And God commands a plant to grow and provide him shade, and it grows. And at nighttime, he commands a worm to eat it, so the plant falls. And then the next day, he's making a point to Jonah, and he calls for an eastern wind to blow in and make him hot. He controls the smallest things. Proverbs 16.33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. In modern day tongue, we would say, every single roll of the dice in Vegas, every time that dice turns up with a certain number, it's dictated by God. That's right. When you're at home playing Scrabble with your family members or friends, every letter you pull out of the bag is controlled by God. Last night, I saw Clyde and my daughter playing backgammon. Every time the dice was rolled, it was controlled by God. There is nothing random. There is nothing insignificant with God. He is the ultimate micromanager. Right? He, is, he is the ultimate subatomic manager. I don't Doug, is there a better term we could use as anything smaller? <laughs> no, that's good enough. <laughs> He's a cork manager. Yeah, cork <laughs> manager. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We're gonna look at some examples of human affairs. Let's start with God speaking creation into existence. That's the kind of power that he has. Let there be, and it occurs. Exodus 4.11. It's a passage where Moses, being called by God, is calling back to God, saying, please don't pick me, I'm not eloquent of speech, I'm not suitable for this task. And God says, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute, or deaf, or seeing, or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Disabilities, bad things, come from God for his purpose. And oftentimes we don't know what the purpose is. Sorry. Jim Baskin having a public restroom incident in the woman's <laughs> bathroom was from the Lord. It was ordained by God. And I think the purpose was for us to have a good laugh. <laughs> I just told a joke at your expense, Jim. We want to hear the laugh. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You did one right one this time. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Deuteronomy 32, 39. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. All life is from God, and it's taken from God for his purpose. Daniel 2.21, he changes times and seasons, he removes and sets up kings, he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. We talked a little while ago, I think at the beginning, about, how, about the fact that we refer to kings, earthly rulers, as sovereign. God's sovereignty has no limitations. So... We really need to use this word in comparison to all these things. What is the scope of this? For men, these are all limited, and they're all limited by God. This is what Proverbs 21.1 says. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. 
Job 12.10, in his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Daniel 5.19, whom he would, he would kill, and whom he would, he would keep alive, whom he would, he would raise up, and whom he would, he would humble. And we see this great analogy that Paul gives us in Romans 9, the potter and the clay, which we also get from Isaiah 68, by the way. That, uh, Paul, Paul took that from Old Testament scripture. God's the potter, we're the clay. We have no right to question our maker. What we do have the right to do, that God calls us to do, is to come into a greater realization of him. Step one in that realization is recognizing the sovereignty of God. And here's the great news. You know, if God were sovereign, if he were infinitely free, powerful, and wise, and could do whatever he willed, and he used those powers to be evil... Imagine what life would be like. You know, every day, the most glorious truth to me is that out of all the possibilities we could have been faced with, God is good. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that He sent His Son freely to save us. You know, I mean, all we're left to do is bow in awe at that. And any time we look around our lives and we say, you know, such and such isn't going well, um, I can't understand how God will possibly allow this to happen. You know, uh, there's a car wreck and a toddler, a baby girl flies through the windshield, dies on the road. Your baby's born, you know, deformed. How could that be part of God's plan? How could that be a good God? Those are the questions that enter, that enter people's minds. And we have to recognize the sovereignty of God to the extent that I have talked about today. Because when you realize that, everything's okay. Now, I love Andre Piet's, um, he has kind of this, this theme for his blog. It's, you know, in the end, everything will be okay. If it's not okay, it's not the end. <laughs> it, 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 it will be, you know. Yeah. So, God's sovereign. There are no limitations to his power, his freedom, his wisdom, or his ability to, come, to accomplish his will. He manages everything in creation from the smallest to the largest detail. He is the great author, the great novelist. I stand in awe every day at the sobering fact that God is love mm -hmm. and that he's perfect. And that all of that ties in perfectly with his sovereignty.